Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. I could be singing some bass this morning. Hey, everybody. Welcome 2022. Man, that's kind of crazy to say that right now, but here we are, 2022, and I am so glad to have all of you join me today, whether it's live or Memorex, and nah, it's not Memorex, it'd either be live or later, and uh, so I, I just, it's good to have you with, with me today on this very cold, brittly, brutally cold morning. Matter of fact, let's look and see what the tip is. Uh, let me give it to you this way on the screen. Looks like here in Sepulpa, let me make sure I refresh my screen, and uh, uh, yep, it's 22 whole degrees, so we've warmed up to 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, what am I reading there? By the way, it's just kind of a, of a fun way. If you didn't know it, you can go to Beams of Light at Sepulpa.com, and I'm on the Visit Us uh, uh, page, and we have the weather up there all the time. You can see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Boy, it's going to warm up, so anyway, it's right there. This is what the... Uh, Home screen looks like, uh, for those of you uh, who haven't visited a, uh, Beams of Light in a while. And good morning, everybody, and uh, Stella and Joanne and Robin and, and everyone else that's going to join us. But again, I'll just give it give you that, that visit us, man. It goes right there. It, it gives the service times and also our whole warming trend of woo, 22 degrees and uh that's just, I don't know, that's just that's just pretty cold. And uh, I want to share something with you today. I, um, I, I'm looking at Matthew, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you um, here on the screen in just a moment from the Jewish Voice Bible, uh, the Tree of Life version, uh, the opening of the book of Matthew. Matthew's probably the most Jewish written of the four Gospels, and... Uh, he starts out, he, and, he, and he tells, can you hear my voice? I, I stood outside for a little bit longer than I probably should have yesterday, so my voice is a little bit crackly. Good morning, Nan and Patty and Sorella. Bless all of you. Bless you good. It's going to be a good year. I promise you it's going to be a good year, and we have a lot of good things to look forward to. Let me, let me give you some real quick um, notes on the screen so that you can, you can see. Um, you, you may probably already know this, but if you don't know it, it's a good thing to remember. Uh, when, when you watch me here um, on Facebook or YouTube, uh, turn your screen sideways instead of this way. And uh, matter of fact, I'm always trying to I'm always trying to in, in, educate people when you take pictures. And this is for another thing, but uh, just look at your TV screen and tell me: does it look like this or does it look like this? It's not like this. It is like this. And so if you take your pictures this way, you get the full benefit. If you watch me or anybody else you watch on YouTube, you turn it sideways, uh, you get it full screen. And so the graphics come up a lot better, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, when you see the little promos come up on the Facebook, and uh, if you just click remind, set reminder on that promo thing, uh, on that preliminary announcement, if you click remind me or set reminder, it will give you a reminder the closer we get to the live broadcast. And uh, good morning, my brother Taylor. Love you, buddy. All the way down to Texas. I don't know if it's cold down there. I hadn't looked at the at the temperature, but I'm thinking it probably is. And my beautiful wife, thank you for joining me. So anyway, that's just that's just a good a good thing to remember. Let me give you the uh, announcement again here on the screen, if I could. You can't sit here forever. And that's a I, I actually had a, a, you might call it a vision, but I had, a, I had a, a, a view a few days ago. And the view looked like this. It was somebody sitting on a fence, and there was a crowd of people that were right next to them. The, the, on, on one side, just nothing but people. But then on the other side, there was nothing but a, a small, detailed, distinguished path. And as the Lord began to talk to me about this, you can't sit on the fence. You can't sit here forever. I want to really encourage you as you listen to me today that you and I really have made a decision whether we want to admit it or not 
not deciding is actually making a decision. You all realize that. And so I, I want to show you this story. The Sermon on the Mount is where we're going to go to. And uh, this is, let me, give, uh, let me give you a couple of other things uh, here on the screen. Let me give you the beams of light. Uh, I so appreciate all of the, the ministry blessings that you all give, either online uh, at beams of light at sepulpa.com or there at the mailbox, uh, P.O. Box 906. Let, let me put one more thing. There's three characters in the story of the Sermon on the Mount. And I know everybody's like, oh, I've heard the Sermon on the Mount all my life. Okay, just, but just hang with me for just a few minutes here. I too thought the same thing until the Lord started showing me some things in the Sermon on the Mount. And as I began looking at it, I realized that I really do identify with one of the characters. <laughs> I don't know how you are, but when I watch movies or watch something, I kind of identify with somebody. I try to. It's somebody, you know, maybe that's the hero. It's somebody that everybody likes. It's somebody that I can, I'm like, man, if I was in that story, I was playing the role, that's the role I would want. In the parable or the Sermon on the Mount, we can either be one of not actually three. There's three characters in the story. It's Jesus and, and sorry, we can't be him. Or we can either be uh, the disciples we can relate to them or we can relate to the crowd. So let me let me start with Matthew's writings and then we're going to get into this. We're not going to get into it real in real depth. Um, Jesus talks for what three chapters and it, it's it's interesting some of the things that he says. And so I want to show you from my Jewish voice Bible here first of all. Let me bring it to you there on the screen. Uh, come on there you go. there you go. So Matthew starts off like this. Now he starts off the book of, of the genealogy of Yeshua Hamashiach ben David ben Avram. okay, in your King James Version and my King James Version. He's saying the book of the generations of Jesus, and Jesus we know to be, his Hebrew name was Yeshua, uh, or Savior, and Christ is the Messiah, or the Anointed One. And so technically, really, what Matthew is starting out here to say is that he's saying this is the book of the generation of Jesus, literally, Jesus the Christ. Now, I want to get you to a place today when, when we finish here that you and I can identify and say that is who I identify with in the Sermon on the Mount. I identify with either the crowds or, and I, I just have crowd on there, it should be crowds, or the disciples. And I put something else on there. I'm just going to leave it on the screen for a moment. Fence setting should not be comfortable. Okay, now I know in our, in, we, we had a little picture of the fence sitting and it, it, there's different types of fences, but in my vision, what I saw was a barbed wire fence. And if any of you have ever had anything to do with barbed wire fence, it's, it's precarious. And the tighter it is, the harder it is to cross. But if we're fence setting and you're going, ah, well, Pastor Mike, you're not talking to me. Well, well, hang on, hang on. Uh, the halfway house, I put that in there too. How many of you know about the halfway house? Okay. I love, the, I love the concept of a half, halfway house. I love the possibility of a halfway house uh, in anybody's life that needs that halfway house, but it's not meant to be permanent. The halfway house is not to be a permanent dwelling. Neither is the fence setting. So I, I want to I want to get us on or on into uh, into Matthew. Let me let me bring this up on the screen so you can see this. I'll, I'll get me off for a minute and I'll make this larger. And again, thanks for joining me. This is going to be this is going to be a good teaching today. Uh, let me get these others off the screen so you can see it better. Uh, all right, so. What Matthew does, and, and uh, forgive me for moving this all around, but what Matthew does leading up to the Sermon on the Mount, what he does is he gives a comparison of the history of Israel to the history of Jesus in his own life. And what I, what I mean by that, and, and I'll, I'll bring those back up on the screen, what we've got to understand is in the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, 
you have a person that's representing the nation. So they really looked at a, at the person, the lead person, like Moses, uh, like the high priest. They were the people. In other words, the high priest was the people. Moses was Israel at the time. So if you'll, if you'll think about this, what Matthew writes about is he writes a, a, a story leading up to the Sermon on the Mount, the first sermon. I thought that's kind of cool. First sermon of the year for me, the main sermon for Jesus. And that sermon has to do with the kingdom of heaven. It has to do with the kingdom of heaven is near. And it really relates to the Jews because if you think about all they knew, let me go back to the screen here. If you think about all that they knew in their own history, this is what Matthew does to bring them up to this place where Jesus goes, sits down, and he teaches his disciples. So Matthew compares the history of Israel to the history of Jesus in his own life. Example, Israel or Jacob was the he was the mirac uh, he was the miraculous child of promise. Well, according to Matthew the first chapter, Jesus is also the miraculous child of promise. Then Israel and and uh, I misspelled that one just to see if he was paying attention. No, I'm kidding. I just now saw it myself. Israel went down to Egypt. Jesus went down to Egypt. I'm not going to share those scriptures. If you come back to this, you can just pause and then go look at the scriptures yourself. Israel went up out of Egypt, and then Jesus comes up out of Egypt. When you're reading that in, in Matthew, it just sounds like, you know, that it, there's no point to any of this, of Matthew writing about this history, but there is a point to it, especially if you're a Jew and all you've known is this history, and I'll show you here in a minute, Israel went through the water. We know they crossed over. The, Jesus also went through the water, Matthew 3. And then Jesus went through the wilderness, or Israel went through the wilderness, and we know they didn't get it right. But Jesus goes through the wilderness, led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, and he got it right. So all of a sudden, you're looking at this thinking, oh, Matthew is painting a picture to a primarily a Jewish audience, and he's painting a picture of Jesus that shows them Jesus not as the individual, but Jesus as the new Moses. Much more, I understand. But the new Moses for them, who that's all they've known, it's been 400 silent years, and all of a sudden, prophecies are being fulfilled, and here we have Jesus coming in on the scene, and so now, let me take you to the scriptures. We're going to look at Matthew, the uh, Matthew, and uh, let me just delete you. There we go. I know I'm looking on the other screen, y'all, uh, but let me show you. Matthew, the fourth chapter, after um, and, and verse 17, and I'm doing this for a reason. We've heard, we, we all know when you say the Sermon on the Mount, we, we, we go, oh, yeah, the Beatitudes, blessed be, okay, that's, that's cool, that's great. But what else is in there? What else is Matthew painting for us, and what is Jesus really saying? Again, we've got to identify ourselves with either the disciples or the crowds. And I'll show you what happens to the crowds. And you're saying, oh, I don't know, this doesn't even relate to me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because I want to tell you, my friend, 2022 is the year that you and I have to decide, are we going to continue to be a part of the crowd? Or are we going to con and, and be a fence rider, be a, a sensitive seeker, just a, one that's waiting for the right thing to come along? Or are we going to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus? So Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. Now that's important. Repent, turn, convert. See, a lot of people, a lot of people... <laughs> I want you to think about the crowds, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But the crowds that were following Jesus, why were they following him? Were they following him for the show? Were they following him for the miracles and the loaves of the fishes? Do you realize that as we get into this, and I, I just want to give it to you now, as we get into the Sermon on the Mount, it depicts the perfect scenario of 
virtually every church today. You have the large crowd that are there for maybe the entertainment, maybe the singing, maybe the, maybe the, the show, maybe the smoke in the mirrors. They're there for all of that. I mean, Jesus was healing people. Then you have the disciples, the disciples. And let me show you how these guys came into the picture. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, I wish I could, I wish I could share with you about the kingdom of heaven coming down. I want to tell you the kingdom of heaven is now, whether you believe it or not. Is it complete and fulfilled? No. But the king, if the, if Jesus himself begins his first message and the first thing that he, out of his mouth, he begins to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, then I've got to believe if it was near then, then it's definitely near now. Lord bless all of you people that are watching. Golly, some of you I hadn't seen in a long time, and I see you there on the screen. God bless you. This is going to be a wonderful year. I apologize for my voice. I apologize that I've got this. I feel great. I feel okay. It's just this uh, business going on in my throat. But Jesus says, verse 17, chapter 4, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And here's what he said to them. I'm going to highlight it for you. And while you're reading it, I'm going to tell you what he didn't say. What he didn't say, he didn't say, I'm going to give you a better life. I'm going to give you better relations and a purpose in life. I'm going to have I'm going to give you all the peace that you want. I'm going to I'm going to just give you all of this pie in the sky stuff and it's going to be glorious and wonderful. I'm afraid that my friends a lot of times that's the message that the crowds are going to. They're wanting the ears tickled. They're wanting to go to something that says, I just want a better life. I just want this and I want that. And so all of a sudden it becomes a seeker-sensitive message that is all about me. But notice what Jesus says. I realize we don't have the record of everything that went on, but what record we do have, Jesus says unto a couple of guys that are fishermen by trade, in fact, they're doing what they love to do. They're doing what brings them the monetary blessing that causes them to have a living. And while they're doing that, Jesus says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And notice what they did, verse 20. And they straightway immediately left their nets and followed him. Read on. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. He called them. They're also doing exactly what they want to do. I mean, it was the it was the family business, the Zebedee and Sons fishing business. I don't know what they call themselves, but there they were. And and what happened? Verse twenty two. And they immediately left their ship, left the ship, and their father. They left all of that to follow Jesus. Now. There are the four disciples. I don't know if there were any more disciples that gather on this Sermon on the Mount. But what we have is the four we know of. And then Jesus went about all of Galilee, verse 23, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing, oh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What was he preaching? Was he preaching a feel good? Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be glorious. What happens, my friend, is a lot of times we get into that mode of thinking that it's all about us. We're going to get favor. We're going to get blessings. You know, we're going to we're going to serve Christ because it'll give us a better parking lot when we go to Walmart. We're going to serve. <laughs> Come on, guys. Really, we do. It's like it's all about me. It's all about favor. We're going to have this better. We're going to have that better. And I'm not I'm not preaching against any of that. I'm telling you, we need to determine where we are in 2022, whether it's riding the fence still or and with the crowds or or are we really a follower of Jesus Christ? These guys left everything. They just dropped it.
They dropped it and they followed Jesus. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go back to the verses here. And uh, Jesus went about Galilee teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's what Jesus preached. And I'm kind of pretty sure that's what we need to be preaching today. The gospel of the kingdom. Oh, it's it's all throughout your Bibles, the gospel of the kingdom. And it started right here. It says, and healing all manner of the six sicknesses and manner of disease. And his fame, verse 24, went throughout all Syria. Yeah, you you start seeing, you start having miracles, signs, and wonders, and, and people start coming because people are in need of a miracle. Most people are more in, uh, uh, wanting more, they'd prefer the miracle than the provision. But I'm going to tell you, there's a better way of living this life in the kingdom of God. It's a better way than just needing another miracle and needing another miracle. There's nothing wrong with miracles, and when you need them, you need them. And I'm praying for more miracles in this 2022. But I want to tell you, the, the, these guys, these disciples left. Then they started seeing all of the miracles that Jesus performed in and with them. All right? Thanks again for, for being with me. Let, let, let me go on. His fame went throughout all series. Syria, and and it tells all the ones all the things that were healed. I'm trying to get us to actually the Sermon on the Mount. We're not going to go through the whole three chapters. No way today, but I just want to get this thought in your mind of identifying, and maybe I can bring it back on the screen. Identifying with one of the characters. No, I can't. Uh, but I can bring Fence City. Identifying with. Are we just? Part of the crowd and the fence sitters, are we a disciple of Jesus Christ? So after his fame goes and it tells of where all the different 10 different cities were following him, verse 5, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. Now, you, again, you got to understand what's going on. This is a Jewish audience. And the way Matthew is, point, is, is portraying all of this You've got to think, if he's comparing the history of Jesus' life right now to the history of the, of, of the Jews, Israel, he's going through all of those things about leaving Egypt, the promised child, leaving Egypt, going through the water, going through the wilderness, and now he goes up to a mountain, <laughs> kind of feels, and it sounds like he, they're probably thinking, Moses, Mount Sinai, giving of the law. Are you with me? All right. So now let me find my mouse and get back to the scriptures. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, in other words, when he sat down, that's the way they taught back in those days. And so that was like, okay, Jesus is about to teach. This is the rabbi teaching. The big difference, oh, let me just say this, the big difference between Moses and the new Moses, if you if you were following me earlier, is Moses was sharing what was spoken to him. And and now that's not what is happening. Jesus is going to speak as the word made flesh. Oh, hallelujah. The Sermon on the Mount is not just about what we should do. It's not just about the things we need to have as part of our life. The Sermon on the Mount is about who? It's about Jesus. And and let, let me go back. Let me go back here to this verse real quick. And y'all, you surely you don't have any any place to go on this cold Sunday. Just just hang with me for a little bit. I I want to go back to verse uh, twenty one. Going from thence, he saw the other two brethren, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Okay, he called them. Now they left the ship and their father. It makes me think of that scripture. In James, faith without works is dead being alone. In other words, guys, these, these, these disciples, they weren't like the crowd. They didn't just confess and make a good confession and have no change in their life. They made a confession. They made a commitment, and the change was obvious. Faith without works is dead. Their works followed their faith when they left those nets, when they left that boat, when they left their father and began to follow Jesus. What am I after today? 
This is what I'm after. I'm after the fact that we need to be making a real commitment in our lives. If you, if you started out this journey based on just a bunch of hoopla and, and a bunch of, uh, oh, it's going to get better and things are great and, and we're going to miss hell and we're going to make heaven. And if that's all that your commitment consists of, you're missing out on the greatest part of the journey. And that's a real relationship with Christ. Jesus doesn't want to just save you from hell and, and, and get you to heaven. The reality, if you look at this, as he begins preaching, the kingdom of heaven is near, then the work of the cross, what he's doing is he's come into a broken world. If you, don't want, if you want to know what heaven looks like, just look around you and look at the best that we have and then look at it as if it's not broken. It's fixed. Jesus is about to preach a sermon that talks about the kingdom is near and emphasizing that he wants to bring heaven to us. He wants, it's not just about escaping and getting out of here. He wants to bring the best of what he has to offer into our life on a daily basis, but it takes getting off of a fence and making a real decision and commitment for him. Let me ask you this question. What would your congregation or your church, as we call it, look like if every single person in that body of believers were just like you. What what would it look like? Would we be wondering if we're going to have enough people to be there for church today because of your inability to be committed? Or or if everybody in the in the church was just like me, would would we have plenty of tithes and offerings? Would we always have faithful attendance? Would we always have somebody stepping up and volunteering and saying, "Hey, I'll do that. I, I want to be a part." Or would it be the opposite of that? I think it's a good question, and I think it's especially good on this brand new twenty twenty two. I'm not I'm not much into into, into making all these these things. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do. I, I'd rather see the the faith and the works together. You, you you show me your works and by your faith by your works, and that's where I, that's where I believe God would have us to be, and that's why He goes on. And I, I see that comment on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus later on tells his disciples, He says, "This is this is how you pray." We call it the Lord's prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. It's my prayer. He says, "This is how you pray." Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not just religious jargon. That's not just religionese. That is a real prayer, a real template. And go back and look again. Right before that is where he's talking about, and don't do vain repetitions like the heathens do or like the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they, they do it to be heard. So don't pray that prayer as just repetition. Pray it in its reality, in understanding that right now in this very moment, I can pray and believe that the kingdom of heaven is near. It was near then, and now on the other side of the finished work of the cross, <laughs> oh, hallelujah, I know it's even closer to its completeness and its fulfillment than it has ever been in my life or anybody else's for that matter. So well, let me take you back, and, and, and I'm not saying we're closing, but we're, we're going we're gonna to get close to that because I want to show you. Thanks for being with me, by the way. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with me on this Sunday morning or whenever it is that you you come back. And again, this whole thing looks like church because I want to show you. Verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So you, you got a picture of this. His disciples come to him, at least four that we know of. And verse 2 says, Matthew says, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, 
and he opened his mouth. Well, yeah, when I teach, my mouth's got to come open. But is there more to this? Is Matthew saying more? Is he saying, oh, think about what John said. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was, he was light and the darkness comprehended it not. In other words, when he speaks, he's not just speaking as a man. He's speaking as deity. He's speaking as one in the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. As he speaks, oh, hallelujah. I want to tell you, he has spoken. He has spoken, church, and he says, he starts and he, he teaches them, and, and I want to I want to take you to the very end and then and then come back. He teaches them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is that what yours says? Is I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna pull it. Nah, not that much, right there. There's is the kingdom of heaven. Sounds kind of present tense to me. I don't know. I may I may be really, really, really weird. But Jesus goes on and he gives all these wonderful beatitudes. He gives all these blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And the disciples are sitting there. Now there's not opposition to Jesus. So there it's not that he has any major opposers at this point. What he has is the disciples who have already bought in. They've already bought in to the discipleship. They they drop their nets and they're following him. They've bought in. They're not still thinking about it. They're not still seeking. Back in the 90s, in the late 90s, I remember a movement that's still going strong today. And it was a movement called Seeker Sensitive. And what it was and still is, is... We just want to make it make a message so that it doesn't offend anybody, so that everyone is comfortable. And then the idea is, as long as we have people in our midst in that seeker-sensitive environment not being offended because they're not hearing an offensive message, then maybe they will come to Christ. Well, let me just give it, let me just give it to you this way. Uh, Jesus is inviting you and me to get off the fence. He does that in a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And whether you've intentionally done it, you think or not, I promise you have made a decision of your path. In fact, in this wonderful Sermon on the Mount that, yeah, he starts with blessed are the poor, blessed, blessed, blessed. But did you know that he also goes over, and, and, and I don't have it on the screen, but I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i read it to you, the seventh chapter, verses, uh, let me get over there, seventh chapter, verse 13. This is still the Sermon on the Mount. He says uh, something like this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Broad is the way. Sound like crowds to me. And many there be which go in there at, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth into life, and few there be that find it. Then you go on over to verse 24, same chapter of, uh, of same chapter 7, and he says, Wherefore, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, doeth them, remember? The disciples didn't just make a confession of, of faith and continue to fish and do what all they'd done, and, and there's no change. And, oh, well, when Jesus comes by, I, I may join in him, join him you know, next Easter or whatever. No, they left everything. They committed. And I know everybody's not going to like this message. In fact, a lot of people that have been on, they may already have gotten off going, uh, that's not for me. I just want to be a seeker. I just, do you know, they're really <laughs> unbelievers that are seeking. Uh, there's, they're, you can't stay forever in the halfway house. Jesus is inviting you and me to get off the fence and make a decision. He's inviting us. The halfway house is real. I believe that there's a time in our life that we are in the halfway house trying to, trying to get a hold of the truth, trying to find our way. But we can't live there forever. He says, there's a, there's, choices to be made. So in Matthew 7, he goes on and he says, 
whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. I think of all the sermons that many people have heard throughout their life. And it doesn't make a change. They don't make a change. Waiting for God to do everything. And then if God doesn't do everything, then it's his fault. God's failed that person. God's never failed. He's a, he's a God that cannot fail. He's a, God, he's a God that does not lie. So if you're watching me and you think God has lied to you, I would, I, I would, I would venture, I would hope that you would relook, take another view of what was told you or your perception of truth. God's not a God that he can lie. And so if we get disoriented in life and we get to thinking God's just a cosmic genie, you know, that you rub him the right way, rub him the right way, here's the formula, and you rub him the right way, he's going to come through for you. Church, let me, he says, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him into a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth, all, he's saying, every th these are these are two different characteristics of people: these that heard and did, now these that hear and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Who are you relating to today? Can't relate to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, so it's either disciples or the crowd. The crowd followed him for the miracles and the loaves and the fishes, and that's okay for a while. It really is okay for a while, but let me take you all the way to chapter 27, and then we'll close. Still in Matthew's writings, I, I just love the way he, 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 he puts all of this. And In Matthew, the 27th chapter, I think maybe I even have it. Um, no, I don't. I don't have it there on the screen. That's all right. Matthew 27, I do have it this way. Let me give you another, let me give you another way to look at it. I want you to see what I'm looking at. Okay? Look, give it, don't get dizzy on me. Let it get a focus. Okay, there we go. I'm Matthew 27 and verse 22. Pilate saith unto them. Everybody say, them is the crowd. Them is the crowd. Not the disciples. What shall I do then with Jesus? Come on now, focus here. All right, sorry, guys. Let me get it. There we go. What shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? They say unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why, what evil hath he done? But they cried the more, saying, let him be crucified. This is the same crowd that was, was hailing him just a few days earlier that was saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, waving palm branches for crying out loud. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the, before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. I want you to think about that. That's where the crowd ends up being. The crowd at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount are the ones that are being healed and they're following Jesus. They gather up and Jesus knows that they're listening. But when you read, blessed are ye and ye are the light of the world in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to the disciples with the crowd hearing what he's saying. He's inviting them, you too can become part of this. Where are you today? You still just listening to sermons and letting someone else do all the digging of the Bible scriptures for you and just walking along and doing your deal of, of well, I give my tithes. I go to church once in a while when I can, when it's convenient, when, you know, I don't have anything else to do. And and uh, you, are you, are, is that where you're at? Or are you 
in a real intimate getting off the fence commitment with Jesus. My prayer is that 2022 will be a total turnaround for you, that we will all do the repent for the kingdom is near. Repent for it's the only way to live. My friend, I challenge you for 2022. Golly, it's just hard to say. 20. 22. Don't look at all the things that are going on in our world and, and, and don't be a scoffer. Don't be a, uh, a doomsday uh, person. Don't be a, well, it's only going to get worse. And don't be somebody that's just sitting around on your hands and, 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 and going, well, if God don't do it, I don't know what we're going to do. God has you. God has a body to work with, in, and through. And if you are part of that body, I tell you, he's going to use you in a mighty way this year. So ask God, Lord, where am I in this in this message? Where am I in the Sermon on the Mount? Am I one of the disciples that are that have gathered there by you while you're sitting and teaching, or am I just still one of the crowd? Am I still just bleeding? Am I still just feeling my way and and wondering should I make a commitment or not? Listen, it's time. It's past time for some of you to make that commitment and say, I'm buying in just like those disciples did. I'm selling it out to you, Jesus. Be Lord of my life. I've made a pretty good mess of it, and it is nothing but up from here. Jesus invites you to allow him to come into your life. A broken, brittle, bruised, confused individual and turn you from a fence-setting, seeker-sensitive place that you're just still living in that halfway house. You don't want to make a commitment because, well, what might I have to give up? (laughs) Whatever you think you've got to give up, I promise you, what God has is so far exceeds that is uncomparable. It is not even a comparison. Father, I have delivered my heart. There's so much more, Lord, on this Sermon on the Mount. There's so much, and I want to get into more of it, Lord, if you'd, if you'd have us to. But Lord, I know many of these that are watching, and 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 I know many of them have made that commitment. They've jumped off of that fence. They've, they've left the halfway house, and, and now they're following you. But Lord, those that are watching, and, and I'm not going to say if, because I know better. You wouldn't have planted this in my heart and my mind if there wasn't somebody that needed to hear this message today. And you that are hearing this message today, I just want to challenge you to give Jesus, who is invited, he's the one that's drawn you. These disciples were doing what they always done, but there was something about Jesus. He didn't. He didn't promise a bunch of a bunch of monk and guck, and and he he re, he he just invited them. He drew them. Jesus is drawing you. He's pulling you to him. So don't let church, don't let the, the we call them the hypocrites of the church, don't let a, a sorry pastor, don't let uh, a sorry building, don't let any of those excuses keep you from drawing close to, back close to Jesus this year. 2022, Father, thank you, Lord, for answering prayer. Thank you for joining me today. Let me bring back up on the screen just real quick how you can how you can make sure you get a hold of us here at Beams of Light. Please share. Again, all you got to do is just click that share button on the bottom, and somebody needs to hear that Jesus has given an invitation to get off the fence. Get off the fence, my friend. I'll bring it up one last time because you just can't sit here forever. God bless you. I love you.